Hey, Satenico here once again for God Loves Comics, and this is part two of the Stan Lee deposition in the case of Marvel versus the Jack Kirby estate, and where we left off last time in part one. If you haven't listened to it, please listen and like and comment. Where we left off is that uh, Stan had reached the point of the Marvel age where he said books sold and that was the start of the Marvel success, you might say. Mr. Quinn is representing Marvel and Mr. Toporoff is representing the Kirby estate. Mr. Quinn asked, and tell me and tell us. Uh, your thinking in the creating of the four different characters, Mr. Fantastic, the Invisible Woman, the Human Torch, and the Thing. Mr. Toborov interjects, assumes facts. Uh, and I will interject and say that that definitely does assume facts. It assumes that uh, Stan created those characters. And more importantly for me, it uh, is absolutely factual that the Human Torch was neither created by Stan nor Jack Kirby. It was created by... Carl Burgos and the Human Torch alongside the Submariner, who was created by Bill Everett, actually appeared in the very first Marvel Comics number one. And that was when Marvel Comics was the title under timely publishing. So neither of those men created the Human Torch. Uh, they repurposed him. And uh, then there's a whole issue with what Roy Thomas did and turning him into an android and all this nonsense where you had a Golden Age Human Torch and then you had a, a Silver Age and Bronze Age Human Torch. But um, <clears throat> that already is an issue in the sense that neither of them technically created the Human Torch. And obviously there were uh, definite precedents for all of these other characters. An Invisible Woman is not terribly original. Mr. Fantastic, I mean, you had uh, Jack Cole's Plastic Man going well back to the Golden Age, and uh, the Thing is just kind of a typical monster-type character, but that's okay. Anyway, uh, after Mr. Toboroff says, assumes facts, <clears throat> Stan says, I'm sorry, and uh, Quinn says, you can answer. Tell you what. Tell us what you were thinking with regard to or the idea behind these specific four characters. Well, I wanted them to be a team, but I wanted them to act like real people, so they didn't always get along well. I wanted one of them to be, we called him the thing, to be kind of a powerful, ugly guy who would be pathetic because, well, they all got their superpowers by being in a spaceship that was hit by cosmic rays, and Mr. Fantastic got the ability to stretch his limbs, the girl, Sue Storm, had the ability to become invisible and surround herself with a force field. And the boy, Johnny Storm, her brother, was able to burst into flame and fly. I took that from an old Marvel book, one of Timely Comics' first books called The Human Torch. Okay, so at least Stan mentions that, even though it is unfortunate that uh, Carl Burgos' name is not mentioned. I always loved that character who had been an android or a robot or something, but I felt I'm going to give Johnny Storm that power. He can fly and burst into flame. So we had a guy who can stretch, a girl who can be invisible, a man who was an ugly monster, and again, to go against type, I thought I'd make the ugly monster kind of a funny guy. He's pathetic, but he's also the comedy relief. And he was always arguing and fighting with the Human Torch, who was always trying to give him a hot foot. And he was always trying to grab him and throttle him. They all loved each other, but they never got along well. The more they fought among themselves, the more the readers loved it. And that was the way I envisioned them. Lee, Exhibit 7, Mark for Identification. Now I'm going to mark as Lee, I believe it's 7, the next exhibit. There's no little blue thing. I'll get you there. It's a document that's actually a magazine entitled Alter Ego, the Comic Book Artist Collection. Are you familiar with Alter Ego? Oh yes, it's a well-known fanzine. And is a man by the name of Roy Thomas. Mm-hmm. Uh, that is, I guess, involved in publishing the Alter Ego. Right. Tell us who Mr. Thomas is. Well, Roy Thomas is somebody I met years ago. He came up to the office for a job as a writer, and unlike a lot of comic book writers, he had been an English teacher in school. Even though he was a fan, that sort of set him above the others, and I hired him. He began to write a lot of our stories, and then when I left to become a publisher, I appointed him as editor-in-chief to replace me. 
And that would have been around 1968, I guess. And let me call your attention to an article that starts on page 32 of Stanley 7. And specifically, this is an article entitled, A Fantastic First, authored by Roy Thomas. Are you familiar with this article? I read it years ago. And specifically, it's a discussion about the creation of the Fantastic Four. Do you recall when you read it? Did you see anything that was wrong or incorrect in the article? I guess not, no. There's a recreation of a note in the article, and it says, Hi, Roy. I found the FF number one synopsis. Oh, uh, he must have been asking me if I could ever get it for him. And then you go on, and that's your handwritten note. That's your signature. Oh, yes. And you recall generally sending him this note. Yes. And it goes on to say, We'll mail it off to you on Monday. It's not clear enough to fax. Then it says, Sorry to have... Sorry to say I have no other synopsis on file. Never thought to save any. To this day, I will never know who made me save FF number one synopsis. I certainly never thought anyone would care about it later on. And then across on uh, the other page, there is a document. A recreation of a document that says, Synopsis, The Fantastic Four, July 61, number one. <clears throat> right. And then it says, story number one, introduction, meet the Fantastic Four. Is that a synopsis that you wrote back in 1961? This is the original synopsis that I wrote and I gave it to Jack. And of course, after we discussed it, we embellished it and we made little changes. But this was the beginning of it. Yeah. You mentioned in your note uh, to Mr. Thomas that you hadn't saved others because you didn't think anyone would ever... Did you create other synopsis from time to time? Oh, yeah. In the article, on the first page, I will just read it to you. It says, Mr. Thomas writes, Actually, this wasn't the first early 60s synopsis of Stans I'd seen. And it says, See later part of the article. And when I had gone to him, to work for him in July 1965, I had learned that he was increasingly dispensing with written synopsis with Marvel artists, often working merely from brief conversations in person or over the phone. That's right. And is he referring to what you previously testified how the Marvel method came about? Yes. And you see also these artists were so good. I had worked with them for so long that I knew that I could expect from them. I knew what I could expect from them. And I think they knew what I expected. And what I meant when I would give them a few words explaining a story. It's like two comedians who have been on a team on stage for a long time and they can anticipate what each other was going to say. That I couldn't have done with an artist I just met. You know, I had never worked with. But I had worked with these people for so long. We knew each other and we could work where I could give them a few words and they could go ahead and come up with a written, drawn story. They would know what you wanted. And if they did anything a little different, it was usually an improvement. And I would change the dialogue to suit what they had done. I'm sorry, Mr. Toboroff interjects. Since I don't have the entire exhibit in front of me, just the article, I'd like to know the date of the magazine this appeared in and the issue number. Mr. Quinn. Yeah, hold on for a second. I can tell you that. I think it is Mr. Toboroff. If I could just look at Stan's, uh, Mr. Quinn, I will tell you. It's volume two, number two, the summer of 1998. Mr. Toboroff, thanks. Let's turn to page 34, and I'm going to read a portion of the article that's quoting you. Mr. Thomas writes, quote, In answer to my earlier query, Stan sent a few comments along with the synopsis, unquote. Then he quotes you, Incidentally, I didn't discuss it with Jack first, referring to the synopsis. I wrote it first after telling Jack it was for him because I knew he was the best guy to draw it. And you go on, P.S. As you are probably aware, the biggest change that was made after the synopsis was written was I decided to make the thing more sympathetic than originally intended. Right. Mr. Quinn, after giving, after seeing the way Jack drew him, I felt it was obvious 
for such an ugly, monstrous looking guy to act in a typically monstrous, menacing way. That's uh, Stan's quote. Do you recall sending that note to Mr. Thomas? Yes. And what were you referring to? Well, I was referring to what I mentioned before. I would very often give a writer a synopsis or an oral synopsis, what I wanted, and then later when the story was penciled, I would look at it and say, well, maybe we should change this or maybe we should make this character a little more that way. And as I mentioned with the thing, when I saw the way he looked, I thought it would be dull. We got a guy who looks like a monster. If he just acts like a monster, a dumb monster, it would be more interesting to give him a real personality. And actually the guy, some of you were too young to know him, but I thought of Jimmy Durante, an old comedian. Mr. Quinn says, sadly, I'm not too young to know him. Well, I tried to have the thing talk a little bit like Jimmy Durante, have that kind of explosive personality. Mr. Quinn says, the article in the next page, there's several numbered paragraphs. And number five talks about, and I will just read it into the record. The idea of Sue remaining permanently invisible and having to wear a humanoid face mask to be seen. Well, Stan's note at the end of that paragraph indicates that he was already rethinking that bit. He asked Jack to talk with him about it because, well, quote, maybe we'll change this gimmick somewhat, unquote. Since the writer, editor, and artist probably discussed this point before Jack started drawing any number of other changes, including the notion of starting with a multi-page action sequence, may have been suggested then as well by either man. In any event, Sue gained control of her invisibility almost at once. That's right. What were you referring to there? Well, I think either Jack or I or both of us, I don't know, must have thought at some point that she would always be invisible and she'd have to wear a mask or something so people would see her. Right. And whether it was my idea or not, as I thought about it, I thought, that's a lousy idea. So we decided to change it where she could look like a normal person and make herself invisible at will or make herself normal at will. And who in this process had the ultimate decision to decide how that was going to come about? Well, I did. I was the editor. And turning over to the next page of the article, actually page 37, there's another document that's recreated that says, Synopsis for Fantastic Four number 8, Prisoners of the Puppet Master. Do you recognize that as another of the synopsis that you created in connection with the Fantastic Four? Uh, I hadn't read that for so many years, but yeah, that seems like mine. I didn't even know this was in here. Yeah, see? Instead of telling him page by page, I would say devote five pages to this, five pages to that, and three pages to that. Yeah, that was typical of how you were working utilizing the Marvel method. Yeah, sometimes I wouldn't even be this specific. I wouldn't have cared if Jack devoted, say, six pages to this and he changed that to three pages just so he got the idea what I had in mind. But he was good at making his own changes and very often he'd improve them. But yeah, this is mine. Let's go to another character, the Silver Surfer. Oh yeah. Could you tell us how the Silver Surfer came about? Right. I wanted to have a villain called Galactus. We had so many villains who were so powerful. I was looking for somebody who would be more powerful than any. So I figured somebody who was a demigod who rides around in space and destroys planets. I told Jack about it and told him how I wanted the story to go generally. And Jack went home and he drew it and he drew a wonderful version. But when I looked at the artwork, I saw there was some nutty looking naked guy on a flying surfboard. And I said, who is this? And he said, well, I don't remember whether we called him the surfer or not. He may have called him the surfer, but he said, I thought that anybody as powerful as Galactus who could destroy planets should have somebody who goes ahead of him, a herald who finds the planets for him. And I thought it would be good to have that guy on a flying surfboard. I said, that's wonderful. I loved it. I decided to call him the Silver Surfer, which I thought sounded dramatic. But that was all. He was supposed to be a herald who finds Galactus his planets. And by the way, Jack drew him. He looked so noble and so interesting. I said, Jack, you know, we ought to really use this guy. I like him. 
And I tried to write his copy so that he was very philosophical. And he was always commenting about the state of the world. Don't you human beings realize you live in a paradise? Why don't you appreciate it? Why do you fight each other and hate each other? And I had him talking like that all the time. And the college kids started to love him. And whenever I would lecture at a college and there was a questions and answer period, it was inevitably the silver surfer that they would talk about the most. So I was very happy with him. But that's how it happened accidentally. I mean, I had nothing. I didn't think of him. Jack, it was one of the characters Jack tossed into the strip. And he drew him so beautifully that I felt like we had to have him as an important character. You talked about it before, that artists were expected as part of their job to populate the story with characters. Mr. Toborov says, misstates testimony. Mr. Quinn says, you can answer. Pardon me? You can answer. Oh, you see, if there's a story where the hero goes, let's say, to a nightclub. So I would say, or whoever the writer is, would say, the hero goes into a nightclub and he talks to this person. And then there's a gunfight. Well, when the artist draws it, the artist has to draw other people in the nightclub. So the artist is always creating new characters. I mean, the artist might decide to have the character standing at the bar and draw a sexy looking bartender, a female, or an interesting looking bartender. The artist in every strip always creates new characters to flesh out the strip and to make the characters living in the real world. Who is it up to? Who had the last word as to whether or not a particular character would make it into the final publication? Well, I guess I did, and my publisher, Martin Goodman, who might also look at a character and say, I like him. Let's see more of him. Although he didn't do that often. Did he ever say, I didn't like? Yeah, a particular character. Yeah, mostly in the Westerns. He was big on our Western books, and sometimes he wouldn't like the way a character was drawn. Let's talk a little bit about the Spider-Man. How did the idea for Spider-Man come about? Again, I was looking for, well, Martin said, we're doing pretty good. Let's get some more characters. So I was trying to think of something different. I've always hated teenage sidekicks. So I felt it would be fun to do a teenager who isn't a sidekick, but who is the real hero. So that part was easy. But when you had to, well, the toughest thing was dreaming up a superpower. So I thought, what superpower can I give him? And it finally occurred to me that a guy could, who could stick to walls like an insect, crawl on a wall and stick to a ceiling. I didn't recall ever having seen any character like that before. So I thought, that's what I'll do. I'm going to get a teenager who can crawl on walls. And then the second most important thing is a title. Titles are very, well, the names of the characters are very important. So I went down the list. I could call him Mosquito Man, Insect Man, Fly Man. I finally got to Spider-Man. It sounded dramatic. And I remember I had read a pulp magazine when I was a kid called Spider-Man. The guy didn't have a superpower. He was just a guy who went around fighting bad guys. But I thought Spider-Man sounds great. And again, I went to Jack. I think I told you this before, but it's okay. I went to Jack and asked him to draw it. And he did, but he didn't make the teenager look as wimpy or as nerdy as I thought he should be. And I realized that Jack really, it isn't really Jack's style. Jack mostly draws glamorous, heroic Captain America types. Not that he couldn't have, but he would have had to force himself. So I figured I would get somebody that it comes easy to. Jack nor anybody thought that Spider-Man was going to be a big strip. So it really didn't matter. So I said, forget it, Jack. I'll give it to somebody else. He said okay, and he went back to the Fantastic Four, or Thor, or whatever he was drawing, and I gave it to Steve Ditko. And Steve had that kind of awkward feeling. It was just right for Spider-Man, so I gave it to Steve, and that's what happened. Now, did you discuss the idea that you had for Spider-Man with Mr. Goodman? Oh yeah, he hated it. Tell us about that. You want that story? Yeah, sure. Hope I'm not boring you at all. Not at all. I had the idea for Spider-Man, so then I went in and I told him. I said I want him to be a teenager, I want him to be called Spider-Man. I didn't mention that I wanted him to have a lot of personal problems because I thought that would make him very empathetic to the reader, teenage readers I should say. Today is what we call them issues, he'd have issues. Pardon me? He'd have issues. Oh right, personal issues. That's right. And I told that to Martin Goodman, and Martin said, Stan, you're losing it. That's the worst idea I've ever heard. He said, uh, first of all, you can't call a hero Spider-Man. People hate spiders. 
Secondly, you can't make him a teenager. Teenagers can be just sidekicks. And finally, problems. Don't you know what a superhero is? They don't have problems, they're superheroes. So I had a feeling I hadn't hit pay dirt with that one as far as Martin was concerned. But I always liked the idea. So sometimes later, we had a magazine we were going to drop. It was called Amazing Fantasy. Strangely enough, Steve Ditko had drawn all the stories in that one. Now when you drop a magazine, nobody cares what you put in the last issue because you're dropping it anyway. So just to get it out of my system, that's when I asked Jack to draw it. Then I asked Steve to draw it. And we did a little, I don't know, 10, 12 page story. We threw it into Amazing Fantasy in the last issue and just for fun, I put him on the cover. And the book sold fantastically. So a couple of months later, when the sales figures were in, Martin came to me and said, Hey Stan, you remember that Spider-Man idea of yours that we both like so much? <laughs> Why don't we make a series of it? And I will never forget that. Actually, let's pause now because we're going to go off on another subject. This marks the end of DVD 1, off video at 11.25 a.m. and a recess. Back on video at 11.36 a.m., this marks the beginning of DVD number 2, the video deposition of Stan Lee. Mr. Quinn, just for the record, I just want to note that Marvel is going to designate the deposition transcript confidential pursuant to the protective order when it's signed. I guess we're operating now under an agreement. Mr. Tobaroff says, Well, we don't have a protective order in place, and we're not accepting the protective order submitted by Marvel. We have proposed a protective order, the same one we had in the Superman case, but I never heard back from anybody about it. That was nearly a week ago. Mr. Quinn says, I'm sure we'll get back to you shortly, Mark, I promise. Mr. Toboroff says, okay. Mr. Quinn, in any event, let me go back to something you testified about a little while ago when we were talking about the process of where artists sometimes create characters as part of the story. And you mentioned, for example, the possibility of an artist creating a lady bartender. Whose job and whose responsibility if it was decided this was really an interesting character, who would be the one who would make the decision to take that character and make him or her a separate character for a new comic? Well, either whoever is the editor or the publisher. So at this period of time, it would be you or Martin Goodman. At that period, it would have been me or Martin. So for example, with regard to the Silver Surfer, who decided to essentially take the Silver Surfer and make him a separate character? Oh, that would be me. And why? Why? Why did you decide to do that? Well, because I just thought he would be such an interesting looking and such a unique character. We had never seen a guy on a flying surfboard who could travel from planet to planet. And it was you who gave him the name Silver Surfer. Yes. Okay, let's go to the Incredible Hulk. And could you tell us how the Incredible Hulk came about? What was your idea for him? Well, the same thing I was trying to. It was my job to come up with new characters and expand the line as much as I could. So I was trying to think again, what can I do that's different? I liked the thing very much, and I thought, what if I get somebody who is a real monster? And I remembered I had always liked the old movie Frankenstein with Boris Karloff. I'd always thought that the monster was the good guy because he didn't want to hurt anybody, but those idiots with torches who were always chasing him up and down the hills. He was a misunderstood monster. You said it better than I could have. So I thought it would be fun to get a monster who is really good, but nobody knows it. And they fight him. And then the more I thought about it, I figured it could be dull after a while just having people chasing a monster. And I remember Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. I thought, why not treat him like Jekyll and Hyde? He's really a normal man who can't help turning into a monster, and it would make him a very interesting story if when he needs his monstrous strength the most, the poor guy turns back into a normal man. I could get a lot of story complications. So I thought, that would be good. I needed a name. Years ago, I remember when there was a comic called The Heap. H-E-A-P. I don't remember when it was but I always thought there was some really crazy name. And somehow or other, I thought I would call him the Hulk. It's a little bit like the Heap, and it has the same feeling, but I love adjectives like the Fantastic Four, the Uncanny so-and-so, so I decided to call him the Incredible Hulk, and that's what happened. 
I will interject and say that it's really interesting to find out that uh, he based the Hulk on the Heap, at least in terms of names, because the Heap is a character from Airboy from the 1940s, I believe. And that character is an absolute predecessor visually to Swamp Thing and Man Thing. Swamp Thing became a vastly more successful character, primarily due to Alan Moore's run, but also visually, I think he was a little more humanistic. And Bernie Wrightson, of course, uh, his art uh, elevated that character. It's very, very clear at this point, a point that I've already made, that Stan, Jack, and Steve Ditko and a lot of other creators were still clearly plumbing ideas from the golden age and that most of these characters did not come up whole cloth and obviously you can also see that he's plumbing ideas from both Pulp Fiction and I guess if you want to talk about uh, Stevenson's Jekyll and Hyde you could say classic literature at least Victorian literature so back to the testimony Mr. Quinn says and how come the Hulk is green that's a long story. When I did the Fantastic Four, we started getting a lot of fan mail. And the fan, I remember I told you I didn't want them to have costumes. And the fan mail said, well, we love the book. It's great. Oh, it's the best thing we've seen. But you don't give them costumes. We'll never buy another issue. And I realized there's something unique about the comic book reader. They love costumes. Well, I couldn't figure out a way to give a monster a costume. I couldn't see a monster, the Hulk, walking around a costume store or making himself one. So I figured I'll do the next best thing. I'll give him a different skin color. That will always look like a costume. You may not know this, but originally I made him gray. I thought that a gray skin would look spooky and scary and dramatic. But when the book was published, the printer apparently had a problem with the color gray. On one page, he was light gray. On another page, he was dark gray. On one page, he was black. On one page, almost white. I said, this will never do. So I decided on another color. You can do that when you're a comic book editor. You can do anything. So I'll change the color of his skin. So I looked around for a color that wasn't being used. I couldn't think of any green hero. I said, we'll make him green. And it turned out to be a good choice because I was able to come up with a little sayings like the Jolly Green Giant or the Green Goliath and so forth. And that's how it happened. I could have thought of pink or blue or any other color. Now, after that, you came up with the character. Who did you ask to draw the character? My best guy, Jack Kirby. Do you remember giving Kirby directions as to what you wanted with regard as to what he was to draw? I remember the first thing I said to him. I said, Jack, you're going to think I'm crazy, but I want you to draw a sympathetic monster. And he came up with the Hulk. And did you, as part of that direction, give him a backstory and a storyline? Oh, yeah. We had to figure it out. How the Hulk would be. How he came to be the Hulk. So I decided he's a scientist named Bruce Banner. And I'm not very scientific. All I know are the names of things. I don't really know how they work or anything like that. But I had used cosmic rays for the Fantastic Four to get them their powers. So I heard the expression gamma ray somewhere. So I said, let's have Bruce Banner be subjected to a gamma ray and that turns him into the Hulk. But it had to be in an heroic way. So I said, let's get a teenager. They're doing a test for a new kind of gamma ray bomb somewhere. The military is doing that and some idiot teenager is riding his bike past the no trespassing sign onto the test area. And Bruce Banner is in his cubicle. He sees the kid and he runs out to save the kid. Get out of here. There's going to be a gamma ray explosion. But Bruce Banner had a rival scientist who was jealous of him. And when the scientist sees Bruce Banner run out, he says, quick, start the explosion. And the gamma ray explodes and Bruce throws himself on top of the kid to save the kid. He gets subjected to the gamma ray and that's how he becomes the Hulk. And that's how we know he's really a hero at heart. And in creating and then coming up with the backstory, did you... Mr. Tobaroff assumes facts, not an evidence. Mr. Quinn, as the Hulk progressed, did you follow the same process that you previously testified to in terms of how you directed and edited the Hulk stories? Yeah, well, I told Jack essentially what I told you. He just drew it any way, you know, the best way he could, and it turned out great. Let's talk about Iron Man. Tell us how Iron Man came about. How he was created, the backstory with regard to Iron Man. I will make it shorter. It was the same type of thing. I was looking for somebody new, and I thought, I don't know why I thought it. 
but somebody with a suit of armor. And what if it was iron armor? He would be so powerful. So for some reason, I had always been fascinated by Howard Hughes. I thought I would get a hero like Howard Hughes. He's an inventor, he's a multi-millionaire, he's good looking, he likes women. But I got to make something tragic about him. It occurred to me that if he, well somehow when he got in his iron armor, it's a long story, but he gets into a fight and he gets injured in the chest and his heart is injured. And he has to wear this little thing that runs the iron armor. He has to wear that on his chest because it keeps his heart beating. And that would make him a tragic figure as well as the most powerful guy. So I thought the readers would like him even more with that little added bit. And that was it. Oh, but wait a minute. This wasn't Jack. I called Don Heck and I asked Don Heck because I think Jack was busy with something else. That must have been what it was. Don Heck is another artist. He's another artist that we had who was pretty good. He drew the first Iron Man. I think it might have, uh, I think I might have given the cover to Jack to do. I don't remember who did the cover. I think it might have been Jack. And in coming up with the backstory, did you include a love interest? Oh yeah, I forgot. I made up a name called a girl who worked for the millionaire. I figured he was, well, I wanted him to be a playboy. So he has this gorgeous assistant secretary named Pepper Potts. And he's in love with her. She's in love with him, but he won't admit it. He's in love with her because he figures he could die any minute with his bad heart. And he loves her too much to make her a widow. And so he never admits to her how he feels about her, which again is a little touch of pathos for the series. He also has a friend named Happy Hogan, and it goes on and on. Now, in addition to Don Heck, did your brother Larry Lieber have a role in Iron Man? Oh, yeah. I came up with the idea, and when the script was, well, when the strip was drawn, I didn't have time to put in the copy. So I asked my brother Larry to write it. And this happened on other occasions where, yeah, there were times when I would ask Larry to write something. Mm -hmm. um, now let's talk, well, excuse me one second. I may have asked Larry to write it in the script form and then give it to Don to draw. I'm not sure. I may have done that. I think it's interesting that uh, when it comes to working with uh, Don Heck, <laughs> Stan hands it off to Larry, his brother. Um, when it comes to working with Jack Kirby, Stan is very anxious to work with Jack Kirby. So I think uh, that tells you a little bit about uh, the hierarchy at Marvel. I think Stan has been hugely um, complimentary of Kirby throughout this entire deposition. He's also been self-deprecating, even as regards the lawyers and... Uh, continues to lavish praise on Jack not only as a great artist but also giving him considerable credit in terms of co-creating these characters so considering that this entire deposition was intended to be sealed there's no public relations uh, reasons for Stan to have done that so I think um, we have to applaud his sincerity so far Mr. Quinn says now let's talk about Thor mm-hmm and how Thor was created and what your idea was behind Thor. Uh, same thing. I was looking for something different and bigger than anything else. And I figured what could be bigger than a god? Well, people were pretty much into Roman and Greek gods by then. And I thought the Norse gods might be good. And I liked the sound of the name Thor and Asgard and the twilight of the gods Ragnarok and all of that. And Jack was very much into it. More so than me. So when I told Jack about that, he was really thrilled. And we got together, and he did Thor the same way. <clears throat> and what was the idea behind Thor? What was his deal? Well, I wanted him to be, Mr. Tobaroff interjects, excuse me, objection, vague and ambiguous. Mr. Quinn says, you can answer. Well, I wanted, wanted him to be the son of Odin. He is the king of the gods like Jupiter. I wanted him to have an evil brother named Loki. And just like the Fantastic Four, we were always fighting between Doctor Doom and Spider-Man was usually fighting the Green Goblin. I figured Loki would be the big villain. He's Thor's half-brother. He's jealous of Thor. He has enchantment powers. So in a good way, he's a good foe. Thor has strength, but Loki is like a magician and can do all kinds of things. So that seemed good to me. And then Thor had a girlfriend from legend called Sif, S-I-F. 
and I would have her involved in stories and have jealousy and then I wanted some comedy relief. So it wasn't, I don't think it was until the strip had been going for a while that we decided there were three guys, I would call them the Warriors Three. And uh, what I wanted to include, a very fat guy named Volstag, the voluminous Volstag, I called him, who acts like a real hero. Come on, let's go get him. And, uh, but when this fight starts, he's cowardly and always holds back. Another guy like Errol Flynn called Fondrel the Dashing, and a guy like Charles Bronson in Death Wish. I called him Hogan the, Th- Hogan the Grim. And three of them, Fondrel, Hogan, and Volstag, I thought they could be Thor's friends, and they would provide comedy relief, and I'm happy to see that they're using them in the movie, I think. It was something uh, that we both enjoyed very much, and Jack was wonderful with the costumes that he gave them. I mean, nobody could have drawn costumes like he gave them. So, the character Thor, how did, what idea did you have to come up with to give him his powers? Well, we had, uh, what was the backstory? Assumes facts, says Mr. Tobaroff. Oh yeah, well, he mainly, uh, had a hammer, an enchanted hammer. The backstory was I decided to make him a guy here on Earth. Doctor, I forgot his name, but whatever his name was, he was lame. He had to walk with a cane. And for some reason, he went to Norway and there he, I think uh, the stone men from Saturn or somewhere, some aliens who were stone men had landed in Norway and they wanted to kill our doctor. He rushes into a cave somewhere to hide from them. They're coming toward him and he sees a hammer on the ground and uh, some kind of sign that said, I don't remember the exact wording, but whoever is worthy would be able to lift this hammer. Some sort of thing, King Arthur legend. And uh, he grabs the hammer and he's able to lift it. It seems that destiny had prepared that for him over the centuries. The minute it lifts up, he turns into the thunder god Thor, and wielding the hammer, he takes care of the stone men. And then he can become Dr. Don Blake. That was his name. I believe Don Blake. If he hits the hammer on the ground, it turns back into a cane that he always had because he was lame. He walked with a cane as Don Blake. Dr. Don Blake. So he's a surgeon. He walks with a cane. But when he hits the cane on the ground, he turns into the mighty Thor, God of Thunder. And that was the idea. Mr. Quinn says, you have a lot of doctors. Do you have any lawyers in this process? That's pretty funny. Maybe next time, next go around, we do have a lawyer, Daredevil. Daredevil. Tell me about Daredevil. Yeah, same thing. Oh, by the way, I think Thor was also written by my brother after I came up with the outline. I think Larry wrote the first script. Now, let me see. Daredevil. I want to hear about the lawyer. Well, again, I'm trying to think of what I can do that hasn't been done, and it occurred to me. Mr. Quinn interjects, well, certainly making a lawyer a hero would fall into that category. But in any event, go ahead. Tell me about Daredevil. Well, after this is over, I want to write for us. Uh, I figure I will get a blind man, make him a hero, and how do you do that? Well, so I said, what if all his other senses are very acute? What if he can hear so well that he can tell if you're lying because he hears your pulse rate speed up, your heartbeat? He can smell so well that he can tell if a girl has been in the room. He can smell her cologne even if it was two days ago. You know... You get your balance through your ears. So he's like an acrobat, like a circus tightrope walker. He can do anything any trained athlete can do. And on and on. And I figured that's kind of good. Oh, and he has a radar sense and a sonar sense. So when he's daredevil, nobody knows he's blind. He's like the greatest circus acrobat. However, he has a law office. His name is Murdoch, Matt Murdoch. And he has a friend named Foggy Nelson. For some reason, I called him Foggy. And they have a law firm called Nelson and Murdoch. And I have him fighting villains who weren't too super. He didn't fight monsters or anything. I tried to keep the strip a little more realistic. But I love the character. Jack was busy. Steve Ditko was busy. Everybody was busy. There's an artist named Don Heck. No, not Don Heck. I'm sorry. Named Bill Everett. Who had done one of the first strips that Martin Goodman ever had done. Started at Timely Comics. And that was Submariner. 
and Bill was still around and I called him and I said, Bill, how would you like to draw Daredevil? And he said, oh, great. So I gave him what I told you essentially, little more because I forget who the villain was in the story. But whatever it was, that's what I told him. And he drew it and put in the copy. It's a shame Bill was ill or something. I don't know. He couldn't do many strips. He did one or two and then that was the end of it. Keeping with our discussion, could you tell us about the creation of the X-Men? How did that come about? Again, Martin asked me for another team because the Fantastic Four had been doing well. And again, I wanted to try something different and I thought that, well... I could think of superpowers for them, but how do they get their superpowers? I've already had cosmic rays and gamma rays and bitten by a radioactive spider. What was left? So I took the cowardly way out. I said, I'm going to say they were born that way. They're mutants. Now, I don't have to figure out the gamma rays or anything. So I decided to have a group of young mutants. And I really, the more I thought about it, the more I liked it. I said, they'll go to a school... They'll have to keep their mutant powers a secret. They go to a school called Gifted Youngsters. Nobody will know it means mutants. And we'll have a professor who gets them together. And this guy should also have mutant powers. And I will make him have mental powers. He's got a brain. He can send through waves. He can send thought waves all around. And he can send his thought waves around to detect where there's a kid with mutant powers and then he'll ask that kid to enroll in a school and again so that he isn't too powerful i thought i would put him in a wheelchair he's the professor what's his name professor xavier and then i thought of the characters there would be a girl who can do well called marvel girl who could do crazy things and a fella called the beast who looks a little bit ape-like and so to go against type, I made him the smartest and the most articulate of them all. A guy named Angel with wings and so forth. And when I went to tell Martin Goodman, he said he loved it. But I said, I want to call it the mutants. He said, that's a terrible name. Nobody knows what the word mutants means. So I went back and I thought about it and I thought Professor X, Xavier, and the mutants have extra powers. So for some reason, I thought I could call him the X-Men. So I went back to Martin. He said, oh, that's a good name. As I walked out, I thought, if nobody knows what a mutant is, how are they going to know what an X-Man is? But I had the name, so I wasn't about to make waves. So there you go. Martin Goodman is a co-creator of the X-Men, at least of the name. And you gave the uh, this, oh yeah, luckily idea to Kirby. Luckily, Jack was free at the time, and again, he did a wonderful job. Did you again, with X-Men, follow the same pattern you testified to before, using the Marvel method? Yeah, I spoke to him. I don't even think I wrote anything. I think we talked about it. He was on absolutely the same wavelength. He saw it the same way I did. So I said, go on and draw it. He did, and it came out great. I wrote the copy, and it became one of our best-selling strips. Next, Nick Fury. Tell us about Nick Fury. Nick Fury, Agent of S.H.I.E.L.D. S -H -I -E -L -D. There was a television series called The Man from UNCLE that I used to watch and I liked it. And I thought it would be fun to get something like that as a comic book. So I remembered we had done a war story, a uh, war series called Sergeant Fury and his Howling Commandos, Stories of World War II. It was quite popular. I don't really like war stories, so after a few years of doing it, I asked Martin if we could drop the book so we could concentrate on superheroes. He said okay. So we got a lot of fan mail. The kids loved the characters, and we kept reprinting those books, and they sold as well as the originals. So when I wanted to do the thing like the man from Uncle, I thought, why don't I take this popular Sergeant Fury that was years ago in World War II, why don't I say he's older now, he's a colonel, and he's in charge of this new outfit that I made up called S.H.I.E.L.D., which stood for Supreme Headquarters International Law Enforcement Division. So I took Sergeant Fury, who now has a patch over one eye, and I made him in charge of this group. And again, there was Jack Kirby. I said, how would you like to draw Nick Fury, Agent of S.H.I.E.L.D.? It was right up Jack's alley. He loves that kind of stuff, and he came up with all kinds of weapons and things. And again, you had the same process of overseeing it and editing it. Yeah, it was always the same process. Let's focus on the Avengers. How did the Avengers come about? First, tell us the, uh, who the Avengers are. 
well, there's anybody that we wanted to put in the group of our own heroes. I don't even remember who were in the first issue. Might have been Iron Man, Captain America, Thor, Daredevil. I don't even remember because we kept changing the roster each month, whoever we felt like. But the idea was that they were organized by, hmm, I don't remember which of our heroes organized. Oh, they got together and decided to become a fighting team. Again, we wanted something like the Justice League that DC had. Had you discussed the idea for the Avengers with Martin Goodman? Oh, sure. Oh, sure. I couldn't do any books unless Martin approved it. And I remember Iron Man, who was a rich one. I had them use Iron Man's mansion on Fifth Avenue as the Avengers headquarters, and Captain America was definitely Avenger. Iron Man, Spider-Man never joined them. He was a loner. But uh, then I would have them. The toughest thing about the Avengers, the toughest thing about the Avengers, they were all so powerful that we had to find very powerful villains for them to fight. And again, you know, Jack drew it and it turned out to be popular. They're going to make a movie of that too. You needed to have very powerful villains to make it a fair fight. Oh, sure. In fact, uh, it's always the best if the villain, if it isn't a fair fight, if the villains seem more powerful because you wonder how the hero will ever get out of this one. Um, and who came up with the backstory for the Avengers? There really wasn't much of a backstory. I did, but just the idea that they all get together and form a group because I didn't have to create new characters. We had them already. I just needed an excuse for them to get together, and honestly, I forget what the excuse was now. Let's talk a little bit about one of my favorites, Ant-Man. Tell us a little bit about why you came up with and how you came up with Ant-Man. Mr. Toboroff says, assumes facts. Mr. Quinn says, who created Ant-Man? What I could do that was different, uh, I didn't know of any hero that was uh, that big indicating. So I thought I'll go for it. Martin okayed it. I don't remember if Jack did the first one or not. Maybe he did, or you wouldn't be mentioning it. You know, it was just, it was not all that successful. And I later realized why it wasn't that successful. The interesting thing about a character who is that big, indicating, would be to show him against a lot of big things. But somehow, no matter which artist drew him, they always made him look life-size. They put him in the foreground. So you didn't enjoy the contrast of this little guy next to big, you know. They had him near a cigarette and an ashtray, but they always had him somehow where he didn't look like Ant-Man. Anyway, I hate to give up, so at that point, I changed him to Giant Man. He had the ability to become a giant. The ant could become a giant? Yeah, and uh, that didn't become too popular either. Although he's still running around somewhere in the books. Who came up with the idea of making, of having Ant-Man become Giant Man? I'm embarrassed to say that it was me. Mr. Quinn, let's go off the record for a second. The videographer off video at 12.05 p.m. Recess. Back on at 12.06 p.m. Just to clarify, because we may have been talking over each other, who was it that came up with the idea for Ant-Man? I did. Okay, one more we can talk about right now is the Rawhide Kid. Tell us about the Rawhide Kid. I don't really know what to tell you. Martin, the publisher, he loved westerns. He had a lot of western books and he loved the name The Kid. We had The Kid called Outlaw, The Rawhide Kid, The Texas Kid. We had a few others I can't remember. He loved the word and The Rawhide Kid was just one of the many westerns he had. And as far as I know, my brother had been doing most of them. He was writing and drawing them. I don't remember who started it. Maybe it was Jack that did it first. I probably wrote the first one, but it was just, I don't even remember. Maybe it was somebody wanted by the law, but he was really a good guy and nobody knew it. And he just rode around the West having adventures. We didn't put a lot of thought into our Westerns, really. They were all pretty much alike. Just a guy who's the fastest gun in the West, he fights bad guys. And with the Rawhide Kid, you followed the same practice of making the assignment and then overseeing it and editing it. Yeah. Switching to another subject. Do you recall that sometime back in 2002 and 2003, you had a dispute with Marvel? Oh yes. And what was that dispute about? 
Well, according to my contract, I was supposed to get 10% of the profits, of Marvel's profits, from the movies and television and things like that, and I felt I hadn't been getting it. Did you, during the course of that dispute, did you ever say that you owned the characters and not Marvel? And from your perspective, who did you believe owned the characters? Say that again. Who did you believe owned the characters? Uh, I always felt the company did. Now, do you recall during the course of that dispute that my nice friend Mr. Fleischer over there took your deposition? I don't recall it, but I take your word for it. Somebody took it. I don't remember who. I'm going to show you a portion of that deposition. All right. And just ask you a couple of questions about it. We'll mark the deposition transcript as Stan Lee, number eight. Lee exhibit number eight, mark for identification. Mr. Toberoff, is this the entire transcript of the deposition? Mr. Quinn says, yes, but I promise I won't play it all. The reporter says, I'm sorry, did you want me to report it? Mr. Quinn says, no. Mr. Quinn, um, that was you up there, wasn't it? Looks like it. Uh, now, is that a testimony consistent with your current recollection? Yes. And truthful testimony when you gave it. Pardon me? It was truthful testimony when you gave it? Yes. And this was back in November, I guess, 2003. But we left out Thor for some reason. I didn't remember Thor. Well, you've testified about Thor here. That's probably good enough. The videographer. I'm sorry, we're getting some audio interference. Off video quick, real quick. Yes. Videographer, off video at 1214. Recess. Back on video at 1.36 p.m. Mr. Quinn. Good afternoon, Mr. Lee. Good afternoon. Lee exhibit number nine, mark for identification. Lee exhibit number 10, mark for identification. We're going to mark, actually, we have marked a couple more exhibits. As Lee exhibit number nine, we've marked some excerpts from audio and video clips that you're involved in. And Lee 10, a compendium of uh, labels from the University of Wyoming American Heritage Center, which labels various of these audio and videos indicating their dates and when they were done and with whom. Now, and I believe, did we give copies to Mr. Toboroff? That's what those are. Now, Mr. Lee. You've given a lot of interviews over the years on the subject matter of the comic book industry. Yes. And many speeches. Yes. And you've been involved in seminars. Yes. Mr. Toboroff says, excuse me, if I can interrupt. This disc which says Stanley Deposition, it was, is this from a University of Wyoming? Mr. Quinn says, I believe the materials that are on that disc or most of them are from the University of Wyoming. Okay. And this is 10. That's number nine. The labels are 10. Okay. Mr. Quinn says, and were some of those many interviews and speeches and seminars recorded visually or sometimes on audio? Some were, yes. And did uh, there come a time when you donated copies, copies of these videos and recordings to the University of Wyoming? Yes, I had so much around the house, I didn't know what to do with it. They offered to keep my effects and archive what they have. And was there a particular reason why you chose the University of Wyoming? Ah, uh, silly. If I had thought about it, I would have gone to a closer college. But they told me that Jack Benny had his archive there, and they would put mine next to his. I was a big fan of Jack Benny's. I figured if they have him, it must be a good archive. Now, what I would like to uh, do is play some audio and video for you and ask you for some questions about these particular excerpts. I believe, according to the Wyoming archives in 1966, you were interviewed by a man by the name of Jim Saunders on his GabFest program on the radio. And I want to play an excerpt from that audio, and we'll have some questions about that. Audio recording is playing. Now, was that your voice? It seems to be yes. And was that you describing what you told us was essentially the Marvel method in that recording? I have to be honest, I couldn't hear it very clearly, and I'm always talking about the Marvel method. And what you did here, is that consistent with your recollection? Yeah, yes. Could I ask you, Mr. Tobaroff interjects, are you going to uh, the copies here, Lee 10, you've given me the copies of audio disc or video disc with labels, the packaging for the disc with a label. This is how it appears with the University of Wyoming. Mr. Quinn, these labels indicating, Mr. Toboroff, yes. 
uh, Mr. Quinn, yes, Mr. Toborov. And are you, you played an excerpt from the first one in this package. You've given me Barry Gray, January 31st, 1966. Is that what you played? Mr. Quinn, uh, I think we just played one from 1966, a different one. It was identified on the record as Gabfest. Mr. Toboroff, so you, are you going to be producing the whole interview from which you just played this tiny excerpt? Mr. Quinn, yes, we would be producing that. Mr. Toboroff, are you going to supply that to me today? Uh, Mr. Quinn, I don't believe we have that here today, uh, but we will get it to you promptly. Mr. Toboroff says, okay. Mr. Toboroff, and court reporter, are you taking down the audio? The reporter, no. Mr. Quinn said he didn't need me to. Mr. Toboroff, I think the court reporter should take down the audio because you know the disc you're supplying me with on this deposition. To make the deposition understandable, I think she would take down the audio that he's responding to. Mr. Quinn, it's not a problem one way or the other, but it is on disc, so you can play it and you will hear it. Mr. Fleischer, it's not customary to have her, Mr. Toboroff, yes, but to have a, Mr. Quinn says, it's not, I think Mr. Fleischer is correct, it is not customary to do that, but if you're able to take it down, do the best you can, but that disc is the actual record, it is in fact an exhibit to the deposition, so she may or may not be able to correctly given the fact that it's going to be difficult to hear. Mr. Toboroff, I guess my question is, the exhibit to the deposition is going to be a little short part of the interview that you just played, or is it going to be the entire interview? Mr. Quinn, to the deposition, the exhibit is going to be what we have marked as the exhibit, which is the excerpt. Mr. Toboroff says, okay. Mr. Quinn says, okay, now hopefully we'll have that and you'll hear it a little bit better. We have another excerpt and this one I want to make sure that you can hear. This is according to the University of Wyoming Archives, an interview you gave to Mr. Mike O'Dell, WBAI-FM Radio, New York, in March of 1967, you and also Jack Kirby. Do you recall from time to time that you gave interviews with both yourself and on some occasions with Mr. Kirby? Yes. Can we play that? And let's make sure it's loud enough. Audio playing reported as follows. Unidentified voice, Mr. Lee and Mr. Kirby are going to be asked some questions about their superheroes. I guess the first one would be addressed to Stan Lee, and it's the title of this program. Stan, will success spoil Superman? Now that Captain America is back in the fight, is there going to be talk about sending the reporter? I'm sorry, I can't take that. Uh, did you hear that correctly, says Mr. Quinn? Um, I could make it out. The question was, I could make out... Uh, Mr. Quinn says, let's play it again. Maybe if it was a little bit slower, says Stan Lee. See, my problem is I have a hearing problem. I can hear, but sometimes if the speech isn't clear, I can't make out the words. It sounds like blah, blah, blah. You know what I mean? Yep, I know exactly what you mean, says Mr. Uh, Quinn. Mr. Tobroff says, that sounds like that for us also. <laughs> so everyone is unified in the fact that this audio is not terribly clear. Uh, so, uh, after all, it's from 1967, um, a radio show. But it would be fascinating because it has uh, both Stan and Jack talking at the very height of the Marvel age. Mr. Quinn says, let's play it again. The audio is playing, reported as follows. Unidentified voice, Mr. Klee and Mr. Kirby are going to be asked some questions. Mr. Quinn says, uh, quote, will success spoil Spider-Man, unquote. The witness, oh, will success spoil Spider-Man? They're defining the witness as uh, Stan Lee. Okay. Mr. Quinn, then there's a question directed to Mr. Kirby. Play that. Audio recording playing. The reporter, I can't report that. Mr. Quinn, now. What I want to ask you is, whose voice was that that we just heard? That was Jack Kirby's very distinctive voice. And when Mr. Kirby said in that interview, we just heard that the editor always has the last word on that. Do you agree with that? Was he referring to the question? Would success spoil Spider-Man? Uh, no, he was referring to whether Captain America was going to be sent to Vietnam. Oh, I didn't hear that. Well, yes, if uh, if Captain America has been in this country and one of the writers decided, hey, I'd like to send him to Vietnam and let him be a part of the Vietnamese war or whatever, then I would have to say, OK, or I might have said to the writer, no, I'd rather keep him here. 
So you agree with Mr. Kirby that the editor always has the last word on that? Yes. Mr. Toboroff, counsel, are you going to be providing me at this deposition with a copy of these excerpts? Mr. Quinn, you have a copy of the excerpts in your hand. Mr. Toboroff, they're all... Mr. Quinn, we're going to listen to them together. Mr. Toboroff, no, I'm talking about Miss Singer. They're all on the disc. Mr. Toboroff, this is the Stan Lee deposition and the audio's on this disc. Miss Singer, it's the clip from the Stan Lee deposition. It's all the audio and video. Mr. Toboroff, that was unclear to me. Thank you. Mr. Quinn, okay, the next excerpt, according to the archives in Wyoming, involves questions that were being posed by an unknown French man to you. And let's play that, and I'm going to ask you some questions about that. Unidentified voice. I'm not going to go into a French accent, as tempting as it is. Again, on this interview from this guy in France, my method for the construction of the script consists of discussing the story with the artist and having the artist do the penciled artwork on his own, drawing whatever he wants to, so long as it tells the story we've discussed. Then would put in the dialogue and the captions and indicate where the dialogue balloons are to be placed and where the captions go. And then the script goes to the inker. It's lettered, of course, and I have to proofread, and that's it. I proofread it myself, really, as if it's my own story. Mr. Quinn, is that consistent with your voice? Uh, what I could hear sounded right, the dialogue and the captions, and it goes to the, yeah, that was me, Mr. Quinn, and that was the method you used. Yeah. Let's go to the next excerpt, and this one is from the archives. It is marked as NYU TV and dated March 16th, 1972. Audio recording playing, reported as follows, unidentified person. Good morning. I wonder if you could tell us who you are and what you do for people that don't know you. Stan Lee says, my name is Stan Lee. I produce comic books. There are 50 million reasons why we change artists. Sometimes we do it because the book isn't selling well to hype sales. Uh, sometimes we do it because the artist is simply tired of the job. He says, if you don't take me off this thing, I'll go out of my skull and I want to do something else. Sometimes we do it because it's like falling dominoes. An artist is late or is sick and his book is late. And so we have to take an artist off the strip so to do that book quickly and to make the printing date. So we have to take another artist off his book to do this book, which is then the artist came off of. Uh, now we have to take an artist off this book to do this book, and it goes right down the line. Again, is that your voice that we just heard? Yeah, that was definitely me. And is that consistent with your recollection of how you dealt with artists during that period of time? Well, I caught the falling dominoes part. I really couldn't understand what came ahead of it, but the falling dominoes was correct. And what do you recollect about the falling dominoes? Well, it was like if an artist couldn't do one book, you had to take an artist and give him that book. And then that artist had to be replaced on his book by another artist. And you had to keep shuffling them around. And who was in charge of shuffling them around? Well, I was. Now we have a video. This one is dated. Uh, that might be easier to hear. We can hope. This one is dated January 12, 2000, and according to the archives in Wyoming University, it was an interview video that was done and distributed by, I guess, Disney Feature Animation. Why don't we play this one? Video recording playing, reported as follows. Stan Lee. Years later, Jack came back. I don't remember. I guess it was the 50s, and it was great. I would write scripts, and Jack would do the artwork. But then we were such a small company, I was doing most of the writing and most of the books. And then let's say I would be writing a story for Jack and one of the other artists. Steve Ditko might walk in, or John Bashima, or John Romita, or somebody. And they needed a script. And these guys were all freelancers. If they didn't have a script for them, they weren't getting paid. They were standing around and doing nothing. So I hadn't finished typing the script for Kirby, and here is Romita who needs a script. So I said, look, John, I can't stop what I'm doing, and here's a story that I would like you to do, and I would tell it to you. You draw it any way you want. I will put in the dialogue and the captions later. And he did. And then Ditko would walk in, and I would say to him, and Gil Kane, and whoever they were. Now it was done originally in order to save time. 
It was sort of an emergency situation, but I found that we were getting better stories and artwork that way. Because instead of me writing panel one, close up, blah, 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 panel a long shot from above, whatever, I was leaving it to the artist. I was very lucky because I had the kind of artists who are great visual storytellers, and I'm sure they dreamed up shots that I would have never even thought of. But so when I got the artwork back from them, it was beautiful because they had the freedom to tell the story in their own way visually. Also, it was easier for me then to write the dialogue because if you can imagine, if you're typing and looking at a blank sheet of paper, you're imagining what people would say. You're imagining how they would look in the drawing when you have a drawing in front of you. And when you see somebody drawn like, ah, you know, you write, ah, it just makes it so obvious. What started as an emergency situation, it turned out I thought it was the best way to do stories and that, after a while, became known as the Marvel Method. Jack Kirby and I would, let's say, we did the Fantastic Four. I wrote a synopsis of what I thought the Fantastic Four should be, who the characters should be, and what their personalities were. I gave it to Jack, and then I told him what I thought the first story should be, how to open it, who the villain should be, and how we would end it. And that was all. Jack went home and drew the whole thing. I put the dialogue in and it turned out to be quite successful and we worked that way for years. Now, did I correctly recognize that to be a slightly younger version of you? Yes. Sorry, I didn't have my microphone on. That was you up there on the screen we just saw? Yes, it was. A couple of years ago? Mm-hmm. You haven't changed much. And what were you describing there was essentially the Marvel method? Yes. And that was, and the Jack that was being referred to repeatedly was Jack Kirby. Jack Kirby, always. Let me just play two more, a couple of more clips and another clip from the same interview. Stan Lee, what input did I have in the visual development of the Marvel characters? Well, I had a lot of input in one sense. When I created the characters and the idea for the story, I would tell the artist how I wanted him to look. Mr. Quinn. Now, is that consistent with your recollection of how you operated in the 50s and the 60s? Yes. And one more clip from that same interview. Stan Lee, I never owned these characters. I did them as work for hire. So the company owned the characters. Mr. Quinn, and that's still consistent with what you believe today? Yes. Lee exhibit marked for identification? Now, I want to mark, and I think we may have already marked this one. I don't think we have a copy of it, but I'm only going to ask you a couple of questions. As Exhibit 12, it's a book titled Origins of Marvel Comics by Stan Lee. And could you tell us what that book is? Well, uh, at some point in the past, Simon & Schuster wanted to do a book about Marvel, and they asked me to write it. They wanted to know how I came up with the ideas for the various characters, what the origins were of these characters. So I turned out this book and they sold it and it did very well actually. They asked me to do a sequel. I did Son of Origins of Marvel. Then I did one about the villains called Bring On the Bad Guys. And then I did one about the females I think called Superhero Women. Uh, so there were four books in the set and this was the first one. This one, as I noted, was copyrighted 1974. Was that approximately when you did this book? Yes. And when you were doing this book and the other three books that make up the series, did you make an effort to be as accurate as possible? Well, I always try to be accurate and as truthful as possible. Yes. I had to because there were people who were going to be reading it. And if I wrote anything that wasn't so, I'm sure I would hear about it. And okay, uh, I want to go back over a little bit of the ground we already covered, but using some excerpts from things that you've written or said in connection with the creation of some of the characters that we talked about already. Let me mark, or I think we have now marked another book entitled Stan Lee Conversations, which we've marked as Stan Lee 11. And I'm going to ask you whether you're familiar with this particular book, Lee Exhibit 11, marked for identification. Mr. Toberoff interjects, did you mark the prior book? Yes, I believe we did. Have we marked this one? The reporter, yes, bottom right. Oh, it's on this copy. Mr. Quinn, yeah, that one is marked. I need to get you copies of all of these. Mr. Toberoff, you don't have a copy of those? 
Uh, Mr. Quinn, today I do not have a copy of that. Mr. Toberoff, I don't know why, with all this technology around and all these video clips and audio clips, you can't copy a book on a Xerox machine and give it to me at the deposition. Mr. Quinn, well, I'm sure we'll be able to get it to you, you know, promptly. The book, as I understand, happens to be very difficult to obtain, but in any event, let's... Do we have a copy of, no, uh, the Stan Lee Conversations book? Do we have a copy of that one? I believe, or the excerpts that we're going to refer to, Mr. Toberoff, you can certainly utilize the one that's marked if you would like to with regards to the origins of Marvel Comics. Since I'm not going to ask him any questions about it beyond this identifying it, let's take a look at, if you would, at page 137. Um, just making a note that uh, <laughs> he said that the origins of Marvel Comics is very difficult to obtain, which uh, probably is true enough. I actually have an original copy, so brag. Which book? Of the red book right here, the one that has your picture on the cover. First of all, tell me what this book is. Oh, uh, I have a fan who's been writing to me a lot who is a professor at some Canadian college. And one day he asked if I would mind if he did a book. He collected a lot of interviews I had done and would I mind if he put out some of those interviews in book form. As part of his job at the college, he's supposed to do books every so often. He chose this subject and I said, sure, you know, be my guest. And this is the book that he did. So this is a compendium of interviews that you gave over the course of, I believe, about 30 years because it covers, yeah, from 1970 to the late 90s. I never really looked at the years, but yes, he took various things that he could find from my interviews and put them in a book. Okay, and let's look at, I believe, so we have for the record, this was a book that shows it has a copyright of 2007. Is that about when we, yeah, I guess so when it was distributed. Uh, okay, could you take a look at page 137 of this book? Right. And this is an interview according to page 134 that you gave Roy Thomas in 1998. You've already told us who Mr. Thomas is, and I want to refer specifically towards the bottom of the page 137. I'm going to read an excerpt from what you were answering Mr. Thomas has asked you. That would have been in very late 40s uh, or early 40 in terms of when the issues left the office. Less than a year, you became the temporary editor. That lasted for decades. Now skipping ahead to 1961, the story has often been told of this infamous legendary golf game with Martin Goodman and D.C. President Jack Leibowitz, in which Leibowitz bragged about the sales of Justice League of America. And Goodman came back and told you to start a superhero book. Was that story really true? Stan Lee answers from the Roy Thomas question, probably from Alter Ego. Yes, as far as I know it was. He told me that he was playing golf with, I think it was Jack Leibowitz, somebody who was high up at DC, and they told him that Justice League was a big selling book, so he came and said, let's do one like it with a lot of heroes. And your answer here is... That's absolutely true. He came in to see me one day and I said, I've been playing golf with Jack Leibovitz. They were pretty friendly and he said, Jack was telling me that the Justice League is selling very well. Why don't you do a book about a group of superheroes? That's how we happened to the Fantastic Four. That's right. And that's consistent with your recollection and your prior testimony. Yes. Now, could we play from the University of Wyoming archives a portion of a talk according to the archives you gave to the Atlanta Fantasy Fair on July 26, 1984? I'm going to show you a clip from that. Video recording, playing, reported as follows. Stan Lee. Martin came to me one day. He said, you know, Stan, I was looking for sales figures and DC has a book called, I never can remember, is it Justice League or Justice Society? Whatever it was, he said, it's selling pretty well. Maybe there's a market for a team of superheroes. Why don't you come up with one? I said, okay, but I didn't want to do just another DC type book, you know, team of superheroes. Not that there's anything wrong with what they did. So I did a team because that's what the publisher wanted. Uh, but I had to figure out a way to do it differently. So I figured, okay, 
We can do it different. Let's make a team that doesn't always get along well. They fight among themselves. Uh, let's have a girl be the fiance of the hero so it's not a case that she doesn't know his identity or anything. And they're about to get married. And in a later issue, we'll have them get married and have a kid and all that. And let's make one of the heroes an ugly guy and that would be a good thing. And then I thought it would be really great to take a character from the 1930s, bring him back again. That would be the human torch whom I'm always loved. Uh, but I decided to make him a teenager, which I had always hated, but I figured it would make him act like a real teenager. He's rotten and nasty and fights with the thing. Boy, I was good, says Stan Lee, uh, responding to his own um, commentary from 1984. That was you up there in that video? It sure was. And who was the other guy? I don't know. Was it Jim Shooter? Hmm. It could have been. I was looking at me. <laughs> That's the ultimate Stanley answer. Uh, question, Mr. Quinn. Could you identify or tell us who Jim Shooter? Jim Shooter was at some point. He was editor in chief of Marvel. He was over there for a few years. Uh, I forget the exact years. Way after Roy Thomas. Sometime after Roy Thomas. Right. He was more recently the editor in chief. And looking at that video excerpt again, that's consistent with your recollection of how the Fantastic Four was created. Yes. Next, we have a video. I guess I think it's from the same interview we saw before. This is a Disney feature animation interview, January 12, 2000. And this one relates to the Silver Surfer. Can we play Silver Surfer? Video recording playing reported as follows. Stan Lee on the video. I remember saying to Jack, I want to get a villain who is more powerful than any other. Let's call him Galactus and let's make him a demigod. Because we already had Doctor Doom who was king of his own country. How can you get bigger than that? So we came up with Galactus. Okay, now I have Jack a rough idea of the story. He drew it and gave it to me and when I looked at the artwork, there is some naked nut on a flying surfboard that I didn't... <laughs> laughter... I didn't know anything about him. I said, who is this? And this is what made work fun. I never knew what to expect. So Jack said, well, I figure anybody as powerful as Galactus who wants to destroy planets ought to have a herald who goes ahead of him and finds the planets. I thought that was a great idea. So normally Galactus would have just been a herald. I mean, the Silver Surfer would say, hey, Galactus, there's a planet. Go get it, you know? Uh, but there was something about the way that Jack drew the Silver Surfer in the artwork. He had a certain nobility. He was so great looking. And I said, you know, Jack, let's really... Because Jack figured we'd only use him and throw him away. I said, I like this guy. Let's use him. And little by little, we started putting him in stories. And the next thing I knew, I have him philosophizing and moralizing and all the corny bits of philosophy that I might have liked to find a way to get something out of the Silver Surfer's mouth. And once again, that's you up there. It certainly is. On the screen. And that's consistent with your recollection as to how the Silver Surfer came about. Yes. Let's go. Let's have a look back at the book again. The book which is uh, Stan Lee's Conversations. And focus on page 96. Now this is from an interview that you gave to, according to page 85, an interview with Stan Lee by Leonard Pitts in 1981. And this is one of the many interviews that you gave during this period of time. Mm -hmm. As a kid, uh, there was a pulp magazine called The Spider, Master of Men. And I always thought that title was so dramatic. He was nothing like Spider-Man. He was just a detective who wore a mask and he went around punching people. He wore a ring with a spider insignia, so when he punched somebody, it would leave a little mark of a spider on the person. And I figured, gee, why not call the guy, my guy, Spider-Man? And Pitts asked you, although Spider-Man is arguably the most popular single superhero in comics, legend has it that your publisher, Martin Goodman, took a lot of convincing when you wanted to try the character out. And you say... He said it was the worst idea he ever heard. He said people hate spiders. It sounded too much like Superman. And the idea of someone sticking to the wall and stuff, he called it grotesque. And do you recall that interview? And is that consistent with your recollection of the development of Spider-Man? Yes, it is. We have another track that according to the University of Wyoming Archives, a lecture that you gave at Virginia Tech on November 15th, 1977, and I'd like to play that one for you as well. 
video recording playing reported as follows stan lee one reason was as a kid i really loved the pulp magazine the spider i was very young and probably very stupid and to me the most dramatic thing i could think of on the cover of this magazine the series of magazines one was like the shadow but not as famous it said the spider and underneath it was master of men somehow to me at the age of nine the spider of master of men Oh, I would love to be, who wouldn't love to be the master of men? And he had a ring and he would punch a guy in the face and it had a little spider thing on the ring and it would leave a little spider mark on the guy's jaw. I mean, you know, next to Shakespeare. So when I was uh, looking around for a character, I felt, gee, why don't I get a guy and call him Spider-Man? So I presented that to my publisher, who, as you may have gathered by now, is a model of erudition. And he said, nah, nobody likes spiders. That's no good. And I said, well, it's not a case of people liking spiders. Remember, there used to be a green hornet. I don't think people are turned on to hornets either. Nah, I don't like it. Forget it. Anyway, I couldn't get him to advance the funds to put out this book, so I finally, we introduced Spider-Man in another magazine called Amazing Adult Stories, which we were going to kill. The book was dying, and at the last issue of that book, when we were about to kill it off, just to get it out of my system, I threw the Spider-Man story in there. We got our sales figures in later. It was the best-selling book we ever had. We made it into a series, and a few months later, my publisher came to me and he said, You know, Stan, Spider-Man, the best idea I ever had. And that was it. Again, that was you talking about the origins of Spider-Man. That's right. And that's consistent with your recollection as to how Spider-Man came about? More or less, yeah. Let's talk about the Hulk. You have an excerpt, according to the University of Wyoming Archives, of a speech that you gave at the LA Festival of Books in May of 1998. And this particular part focuses on the creation of the Hulk. Video recording playing reported as follows. Stan Lee. My publisher at the time, I worked for a publisher and he said, hey, come up with something else. So I was trying to think of a, something that could be a different guy, a guy different than a guy who bursts into flames or flies or an invisible woman or an orange skin, unintelligible, and uh, a guy who stretches. And I remember I had always loved the Frankenstein movie. You know, the one with Karloff. I always thought that the monster was a really good guy. He didn't want to hurt anybody, but those idiots with torches were chasing him up and down the mountains and making his life miserable. Then I also liked Jekyll and Hyde. I loved the idea that this nice, gentle, dignified, intelligent doctor, I'm sure it was modeled after me. <laughs> he suddenly turned into the most savage, evil guy in the world. And I thought, why don't I combine the two? I will take a normal guy who is like Dr. Bruce Banner and I will have him turn into a monster. And this monster would be good like the Frankenstein monster. But nobody will know he's good. Anyway, I came to my publisher and I said, hey, I've got an idea for the next book. We're going to do a green skin monster. He said, that's great. That's a great villain. He said, who's the hero? I said, no, he's the hero. He said, wait a minute, Stan. You just said that you're going to do a green skin monster. Oh, wait a minute. I'm lying to you. I want to make him gray-skinned, and I don't remember why. Don't know why I thought of gray, but I thought it was kind of mysterious and dark. So in the first issue, those of you who may have seen it, he had gray skin. But here is what happened. The printing presses, I guess, weren't as well-made or as sophisticated as they were in these days. And on some of the pages, the skin was light gray. And on some, they were medium gray. On some, it was totally black. Some, it was different shades on every page. So there are no flies on me. <laughs> and since when you're the writer of a comic book, you can do anything. You're like God. So I said, the second issue, we're going to change his skin color. And I looked around, what color aren't we using? And it happened that nobody was green at the moment. So I made this very intelligent decision and I made him green. Again, that was you? Yes, it was. And that's consistent with your recollection with regard to the creation of the Hulk? Yes, it is. Now we have one relating to Iron Man, and this is an excerpt, according to the archives from Wyoming, of a speech that you gave on July 1st, 1984, a talk at the Heroes Convention in Charlotte, North Carolina. Let's play this one. Video recording playing, reported as follows, Stan Lee. By the time we did Iron Man, we were really facing challenges. I was drunk with power, and I was looking to do things that nobody thought could be done. 
Young people, as you know, were not really big war fans, and everybody said, Stan, you can't do a comic book where the hero is a guy who manufactures munitions for the war effort. This is not going to seem glamorous to our readers. And also, he's a big industrialist, unintelligible. In those days, uh, people were intent on being hippies and naturalistic and stuff. But here's this guy who represented the establishment. I said, wouldn't it be something if we could do him and make him popular? And of course, the one way to make anybody popular is to make him tragic or pathetic in some way. So I tried to turn him into something pathetic. I said, a weak heart is as good as anything. We did succeed, and I'm happy to say the readers did kind of like him. I always thought of modeling him after Howard Hughes. I thought of him as a sane Howard Hughes. And that was a sane Stan Lee? That's right. And that video clip is consistent with your recollection as to the creation of Iron Man. Yes, only a couple of more. Let's focus on Thor. You testified previously about Thor. We have a clip according to the University of Wyoming archives. You did an interview with a Dick Sayet of WFAA News Talk Radio in Dallas. This is dated May 2nd, 1977. I'm going to play a clip of that interview for you. I think this is an audio, audio recording playing, reported as follows, Dick Sayet. I'm Dick Sayet on WFAA News Talk 57. Stan Lee is on the line with us. Stan Lee. You know, we needed new heroes. Finally, I said to myself, the only thing stronger than what we have, the Hulk, is the strongest mortal on Earth. Well, get a guy who is a god. Nobody has really done anything with the gods lately, so I thought to myself, let's see now. What kind of gods are there? People have been doing a lot of stories about Greek gods and Roman gods. Nobody has really done much with Norse gods. That ought to be interesting. Dick Sayet. Norse gods? Norse, you know. N-O-R-S-E, you know? Dick Sayat, yes. Stan Lee. So, okay, I thought, I'd always liked the idea of Thor, the god of thunder, and I'd seen pictures of him, and I read a lot of books of legend when I was young, and there was always a shot of Thor with a huge hammer. I figured, hey, that will be great. We give Thor, what a great weapon a hammer will be, because the superhero always needs sort of a visual gimmick. And I enjoyed the idea that later on I could have him not talk in normal dialogue like take that you rat, but instead uh, thou based varlet, pseudo Shakespearean and biblical dialogue. Mr. Quinn, and once again, that's your voice? Very much so. And again, is that consistent with your recollection? Yes. Concerning the creation of Thor. Okay, let's look back at page 96 of the Stan Lee Conversations book. And again, this goes back to the interview that you gave with Leonard Pitts in 1981. And this is part of the interview in discussing the X-Men. What page? The X-Men. Did you say page 96 towards the top of the page? Pitts is asking you the X-Men. And you respond, they were originally called the Mutants. But my publisher at the time thought that the readers wouldn't know what a mutant was. So I changed it to the X-Men. We are always looking for new superheroes, not so much for new heroes as for new explanations of how they came about. And I was getting tired of radioactive accidents. I felt, why not get some people who are born the way they are, who had mutant power? So I created the X-Men. And that's consistent with your recollection? Yes. And last but not least, we have a video, also part of that interview you gave on January 12, 2000, and this one also focuses on the X-Men. Video recording playing, reported as follows, Stan Lee. And that was how it started. I said, hey, I'm going to use mutants, then they can be whatever they want to be. Hey, they were born mutants, prove them wrong. So then I had to figure out who'd they be. And, oh, I got to tell you a funny thing. Here again, I had a thing with my publisher. I wanted to call the book The Mutants. I thought it was very dramatic. The Mutants. He said, Stan. He patted me on the head. Stan, our readers won't know what a mutant is. Well, he was still paying my salary, so I said, I have to come up with another name. Incidentally, I'm having a great time. So I have to come up here with another name, and I thought, I thought, uh... I don't remember whether I got the name first or I thought of Professor Xavier first, but somehow or another, there was a Professor Xavier with an X. And I thought, I figured these characters have an extra power, their mutant power. 
and somehow the idea hit me, let's call him the X-Men. A little bit sexist, perhaps. There was a girl in the group, but nobody protested in those days. Uh, yeah, no one protested in the 60s. <laughs> So we called them the X-Men, and I presented that title to my publisher who said, now that's a good title. And I said to myself, if the readers don't know what a mutant is, how will they know what the hell an X-Man is? But I needed a title, and I didn't want to argue, and there we were. Mr. Quinn, that's you again? That's my recollection. Consistent with your recollection? Consistent. Okay, getting to talk like a lawyer. <laughs> Please don't. Stay as a comic book person. We first marked as Stanley Exhibit 1, which was the affidavit with the attached schedule. It's probably in that pile somewhere. I believe this is an affidavit that you testified about earlier, Mr. Lee, and it was a schedule of characters attached to the affidavit. And the question I really just have is, you can take a look at the schedule. These are all, I believe, you testified characters that you either created or co-created. Marking document review. There are three of them here that I'm not really sure of. I don't really remember them that well. The one is Richard Fisk. I don't remember that one. I may have created him. I just don't remember. The other one is Mr. Fear, aka Machine Smith. I don't remember that. And there's one Emir. I guess I don't recall that one. The others, though, I think. You do recall all those and created or co-created the others. Yeah, those three you just don't have a clear recollection of. Pardon me? Those three you have no clear recollection of. That's right. One way or the other. That's right. The question I have for you really is very simple. You testified at some length over the last few hours about the manner in which characters were created at Marvel. Mm-hmm. And was that same method used in connection with the creation of the characters that are set forth on Schedule A? I'm sorry, would you say the last part? Was the same method used in the creation of the characters that are set forth on Schedule A? Uh, oh yeah, sure. It was the same kind of method. Right. Mr. Tobroth interjects. Are you referring to the Marvel method? Mr. Quinn says... The methodology that he has testified to over the last several hours is what I'm referring to. Mr. Quinn says the answer is yes. Stanley says yes. Uh, Mr. Tobaroff interjects and says vague and ambiguous. Mr. Quinn says I have no further questions at this time. Mr. Tobaroff, I have no questions. I'm reserving my questions for defendant's deposition of Mr. Lee. Mr. Lieberman, we're gone. The videographer, any stipulations? Mr. Quinn, no. The videographer, this concludes today's deposition of Stan Lee. Number of DVDs used were two off video at 332. The following proceedings were held off video. The reporter, can you put on record with regard to exhibits 5, 7, 11, and 12? Mr. Quinn, we're retaining those exhibits. Proceedings concluded. As an epilogue, I would say that Stan is incredibly magnanimous throughout the entire testimony towards Jack Kirby. He essentially credits Jack with creating the Silver Surfer, crediting himself only with the name and the idea that the Surfer, which Stan said many times was his favorite character, was just good enough to be moved from the periphery to the forefront with his own title. He also tells consistent stories as to the origins of all of Marvel's stable of superheroes from one interview to the next over the course of several decades, citing credible inspirations for all of them. The people most likely to hear this testimony and find any reason to rake Stan over the coals are surely the same dogmatic Kirby devotees who have retrofitted their own narrative that Stan could not have possibly created anything. There is almost a vengeful edge there where they seek to right the perceived wrong that Stan took all the credit for Marvel so they completely rewrite history to deny Stan of any of the credit for Marvel, and in the case of the Kirby estate, to even deny Steve Ditko any credit. Many of those devotees have built their entire careers solely around their idolatry of Kirby, so it's a narrative from which they can never publicly deviate, much like any politically entrenched ideologue or activist. Did Jack Kirby surely design and draw most of Marvel's great Silver Age superheroes? Yes, of course he did. The likely exception being Spider-Man. Did Stan Lee come up with character names, plots, and dialogue? Of course he did. 
So they are co-creators of Marvel's most iconic characters, which means they were both screwed out of the ownership. Stan never gained ownership of any of these characters, but he made a lucrative deal with Marvel which stated that 10% of the movie and television profits should go to him because he was the face of Marvel after tirelessly promoting both the publisher and its characters and creators such as Jack Kirby for over 60 years. Even so, Stan himself had to file his own suit because Marvel was apparently not honoring their deal with him either as regards any television or movie profits. Nevertheless, Stan had always been Marvel's greatest champion, and typically business rewards loyalty and success. Jack had left Marvel on numerous occasions, usually with some bitterness, and then repeatedly returned with his tail between his legs. That's not to suggest that Jack Kirby trying out different publishers and projects was a negative. Of course not. But solely from a business perspective, which is entirely what this suit is all about, money, well, from that perspective, Stan's loyalty to one company was rewarded, and Jack's frequent attempts to score bigger hits elsewhere were not. Does that make Stan an evil company man? Not even close. Nobody believed in giving their boss their money's worth and shifting into the next money-making job more than Jack Kirby himself. Kirby himself was a company man through and through. It's just that over a half a century, he changed companies a few times. Meanwhile, Stan was no more of a company man than the brothers Hernandez, our fan of graphics men, or Chester Brown and Adrian Tamine, or Drawn and Quarterly guys, or Mike Mignola is a dark horse guy. You can make all of the nuanced arguments you wish about why being loyal to an indie publisher is more honorable than to a corporation, except for the fact that Stan Lee started at Timely Comics when it wasn't a corporation. It was basically a mom and pop operation, although it was only pop because it was owned by Martin Goodman and it remained as such until Stan and Jack and Steve turned it into a juggernaut. It's also worth noting that Fantagraphics now publishes Disney and Peanuts. Dark Horse made a healthy living on Star Wars, Robocop, and Predator, and most other indies not named Drawn and Quarterly would happily sell their souls for a movie option. So they technically may not be corporate publishers, but they are all too happy to bathe in the same waters.